If you've played Magic the Gathering for a few years, I'm sure you can guess the name of the ubiquitous powerhouse card that I'm dressed up as today. And if you're new to the game, allow me to introduce myself. I am Force of Negation, or as I prefer to pronounce it, Farce of Negation. And why am I dressed up as Farce of Negation? It's because the artist who created it is today's guest, all the way from Scotland, a talented artist with chest hair to die for, Paul Scott Canavan. Enjoy the interview. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am very good, thank you. I am just making sure this actually works. It does. Loving this jacket, shirt. What is this? This is amazing. It is a jumpsuit, actually. Oh, congrats. That's amazing. Thank you. It's That's actually, uh, there is an image on your Facebook of a guy in a unicorn posing. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He Incredible. designed that. This, this really? Outfit. Yep. What? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, he's that's, uh, that's incredible. He sort of does couture in uh, New York City and, and and all this stuff is like, it's handmade. It's really pretty Wow, That's so cool. Holy crap. Yeah, I'm extremely here for this. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for taking the time to join me today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, and nice to meet you. Okay, so you've you've got a pretty interesting career going on uh now how did you get started originally with your the design and and in and, and your arts and graphic design and concept push what was the the origin story i mean typical boring artist story like i always had you know a creative gene i guess like i was always writing uh and drawing and stuff when i was a kid i always gravitated towards art class in general because I like to make a mess and throw paint around <laughs> and um I never really considered it as a career particularly it was just something I was doing naturally um certainly when I was at school I was very inspired by I, I got really into Warhammer um really into Magic the Gathering as well when I was at school that was when I was about 15. Um, I literally have my first deck like beside me it lives on my <laughs> on my desk because really? like I like to yeah yeah, yeah like straight up my old Tempest deck from well Tempest era 90 when's that 94 97 I can't remember what time is wow. but um yeah I mean I've been inspired by that stuff basically forever um and so I mean I don't want to you don't have to give you the entire story but basically I went to animation school uh because I couldn't think of anything else to do and um I was learning to be an animator and I sucked as being an animator but along that kind of road I learned about concept art you know learning about design for games and stuff like that and it was very much like a kind of obviously this is what I should be doing like that you know I play video games all the time it's literally you know the most important thing in my life I should probably do art for that um yeah that was pretty much the the origin story really uh, why do you think that you sucked at animation <laughs> animation is very complicated uh it takes a certain level of patience to do um so for anyone who isn't aware, I mean, 2D animation is a lot of drawings, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, you know, I was focusing on being a 2D animator and uh, I have ADHD. Projects that take a long time don't really gel well with my personality. And I found it very frustrating. Um, the cool thing, though, about animation is, you know, that industry combines so many different interesting avenues. Like it can, you know, it combines direction, storytelling and writing and all these other things that I'm really into. So while the actual act of doing hand-drawn animation didn't ultimately end up, you know, defining my life too much. I've, I've done I've done bits and bobs of it over the past. I've done animation for some indie projects and, and things over the years. Um, but it was more the other stuff that I gravitated towards, like the character design and, you know, background painting, audio design, all of the kind of other aspects I kind of went into a wee bit more. What were some of the uh, skills that you learned in school uh, for your concept art that you think are probably the most important ones that you've learned and that things that you would tell somebody starting out? Um, well, I mean, concept art as a job is, is one of those like incredibly misunderstood schools of art in, in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of people think it's just pretty pictures, which in reality, pretty pictures are part of it, but it's much more design focused than anything else. Um, I don't think at animation school I learned a ton about it, to be honest. I just kind of got like a little insight into it. I mean, I would say to people who want to get into concept art now, um, I would recommend that they focus more on expanding their horizons and sort of media that they consume and, and try and incorporate different 
uh, approaches to things because the, the truth about all forms of media whether it's card games or films or uh, video games or whatever I mean everything's just like a copy of something else so the more interesting inspiration you can bring in to your designs the better you'll be as a concept designer um, if that makes sense what would be the like if in your opinion some of the best designed games uh, that have ever been made visually um god <laughs> uh i mean there's a lot of great stuff out there you know different there's different games that i respect for different reasons i would say like team fortress 2 is a classic example of really solid art direction where they drew really strongly from a certain art style um you know the characters are very iconic um that's always one that's it's one that i will teach or show to people who want to get into concept art as a good example of hey this is how you design characters who work well on a battlefield however it's aged a little bit now you know it doesn't have a lot of representation so i might take them over to look at other like apex legends or like modern games um but there's so much stuff i mean the fun thing about art i guess and video games in general is that you can approach it from so many different angles so many different art styles you know i love stuff like fez you know i like really stylized 2d stuff a lot um and while I tend to veer towards, you know, very heavily art directed games with like a style, there's a lot to be said for a battlefield or something like that, where there's, it's just like a absolute technical powerhouse, you know, mm -hmm. so play everything is, is generally like, you know, when, when, when people want to be concept artists, I generally just tell them just like play games, read books, watch films, you know, do, do all of that good stuff. Um, because, you know, again, the more inspiration you have in your brain, the better your designs will be. Are there any? I, I love knowing. I love knowing the the uh, sort of like origin stories of where you you get your your inclinations from. Uh, which books or movies were you say? Would you say are the most influential to you, or maybe just ones that you feel like might be just required viewing and or reading? I will say that I'm very basic. <laughs> I you know I grew up as a fantasy nerd who uh, didn't have a lot of friends who were into that stuff. So most of honestly most of the stuff that I read when I was a kid and still read to this day is like fantasy garbage so i don't have massively far-reaching stuff. it's a lot of you know when i was a kid it was a lot of warhammer i was obsessed with warhammer as a, as a child um i still i still love warhammer now but um but some of the stuff i was really into would be like those weird books you'd find that are like here's some cross sections of submarines and cross sections of like medieval castles and towns i think those are like the best thing ever for for like especially younger artists who want to get into design because like they're just an absolute feast for the eyes you know um yeah i love that stuff so much <laughs> and you say that they're garbage because what they're not necessarily like high art or maybe not high literature is that what you mean yeah i mean when, when i say fantasy garbage i don't mean that really but like you know classic fantasy stuff you know you're the books that come out around about the same time as games like any you know if there's like a Baldur's Gate book like you better believe I'm going to read that damn thing all the Steve Jackson Ian Livingston stuff you know all the fighting fantasy books I still read that stuff to this day because I just adore classic fantasy I realize this completely by the way throws out what I said before I'm like consume varied content you know reach for the stars try and find really interesting stuff and I'm just like but also just read like fantasy books you know i love that I mean, stuff i mean you have to read what you want i mean you have to be interested in what you're reading too i mean if you're yeah. if you're force feeding yourself like a, a piece of 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 art it, you're not going to get it and you're not going to like it yeah it it took me a very long time for instance with shakespeare I, it, it took mm. until listening to lorena mckenna sing shakespeare's words that i finally got how good he was up until then mm. i just was not connecting so you know I, yeah. And I love a good like trashy novel. I love Valley of the Dolls. I think it's great. I would say it's 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 terribly written. It's one of the best books ever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think like honestly, what you said there about reaching and and leaning into what you love is really important, especially if, you know for artists who want to build a career out of this. Like, it's worthwhile doing a bit of everything for sure like i'm definitely a big proponent of being a jack of all trades i think that's actually a hugely important thing in our industry um but yeah there's something to be said for just doing what you love reading what you love you know i love discworld books i would read the heck out of terry pratchett forever you know um and yeah just just leaning into what you love is, is really important as well for sure so when was the first like shift towards you know becoming a professional what was the 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 um Thing that you broke in as far as the job or jobs what was the floodgate opener for you well 
I, so I graduated from animation school in 2007. Um, and that was around about the year that I realized that concept art was a, a job <laughs> and that it was maybe something I would want to do. Um, so my, basically, there, there weren't a, as many resources, not nearly as many resources um, available as there are now. So I kind of just tried to learn everything I could about, you know, what, what is concept art, getting loads of books and all this kind of stuff. And I spent about, I would say about two years um, just training, honestly, like got a part-time job in a clothes shop. Um, and I was just like working every day in this clothes shop and going home and working on my art, you know, until late at night. Um, I started getting jobs within the first year, I will say, um, cause I worked my butt off <laughs> and, um, and I was sharing work on DeviantArt was the main one at the time. <clears throat> Back then we had like DeviantArt, uh, which was great. It was like a basically just a, an ego stroking website in, in the best way possible. It's like you post work, a bunch of people are like, wow, you know, <laughs> no matter what, which was great. And then we also had like conceptart.org, which was like the professional website. And that's where you went to get your ass kicked by people who looked down on you. Uh, so like a healthy balance of the two um, ultimately led to me picking up some work um, for like some small films that I don't think even came out, to be honest. So um, yeah. they, what were they about? I mean, what were these films about? I, I, I'm curious. The first one was a horror film set in Africa, which is interesting. Um, and I was doing some concept art for that. So some designs for sets. Um, mostly kind of horror inspired. I mean, I'm, I'm big into horror in general. So Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. yes exactly so like a lot of my work at the time was pretty dark um and continues to be <laughs> pretty dark um what do you mean to rest is such a light piece it's so airy and fun <laughs> i honestly like i was so happy that i got to work on that card because like i i play i always used to play mono black and um you know again first deck right here mono black like old school are we gonna come into focus here like old school classic border black spooky cards i love that stuff so yeah um a lot of the, the work i got early on in my career was very much um spooky films and sci-fi stuff and all that kind of stuff but I've, I've always been interested in doing everything and i'm i always wanted to be good at everything which is like probably some sort of personality defect of mine but i wanted to learn how to do characters i wanted to learn how to do environments um I love sci-fi, I love, you know, fantasy. So just, I kind of basically for the first few years of my career just did everything. Um, I got my first proper job though in 2011. So that was like a proper in-house studio job. So that was after well, four years, I guess, of training. You know, you, to be an artist, you have to kind of cut your teeth for a few years because it really does take a while to learn. I mean, if you look at like a magic card it is a great example, you know, the number of things you need to be able to understand to paint one of those, takes years and it took me years and well took me 10 years until I got hired by magic so put that into context <laughs> it took a while but um yeah um what were what are some of the things that you need to be aware of when you're doing a magic piece uh well I mean to some extent it depends on style um you know the, the I, I feel like the, the typical magic style that we're used to seeing is known as fantastical realism that's usually the term thrown around for this kind of stuff where it's like realistically rendered to some extent you know light behaves as light does skin looks like skin materials look like the materials that they are um but shot through a very kind of cinematic stylized lens i guess mm -hmm. is the, probably the best way to look at it you know a lot of low angles very dramatic poses um dramatic stylized lighting so in order to like conjure that stuff up as an artist i mean you need to be proficient in understanding how light works, understanding how materials work and how they act. Like, what does skin do when it's hit by a cool light like this? You know, what, what happens when it passes through these areas here where like subsurface scattering, you know, occurs? You need to understand, you know, cinematic framing and, and also like posing and things like that to know how, um, what looks cool, you know, like understanding what looks, what is appealing, you know, fashion, under, you know, the, I, I feel like the best, the best magic artists, the people I really look up to, you know, nail all of this sort of stuff. Um, and it, it, that's why it takes a long time because, you know, magic's often seen as one of those kind of end goal clients, right? It's like mm -hmm. a level 10 client. You don't just stumble into Magic the Gathering. Right. You get there because you've, you know, mastered an area of your craft. Obviously, we're all still learning, you know. But um, yeah, there's a lot to learn, basically. And, and that's why, you know, you don't just get there 
straight away. Even if like me, you think after like five years, you're like, I'm ready now. I can look back at my work from then and be like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of a it's a tricky situation because you know you it's good to have confidence, but then you also don't want to be delu delusional. But mm -hmm. so when when you uh, like when you were working um, in house at, for, for the concept art, it, that probably gave you the training that you needed in order to you know get prepared for magic. But then mm -hmm. it, what's interesting is looking at some of like your personal pieces. Like I'm always curious. Like you do like Force Guardian, right? Was an interesting one, and I'm always I'm curious what inspires and in, in, when you got your free time as an artist or not free time but downtime mm -hmm. as an artist and you have the ability to do something that is not a paying uh you know job what makes you compelled to want to do that piece versus say a, another one that's a good question um i think it i think it depends at different points of my career honestly like i think my drive <clears throat> excuse me to make art has evolved over time as well um in ways I probably don't even understand. Uh, sometimes it's just an idea that I want to get out of my head. And like, as a concept artist and art director, which are kind of my main jobs, uh, aside from illustration, mm -hmm. getting ideas out of my head is like the thing I'm good at. And, and now that I've built up my skills enough that I feel confident doing it, it's like a kind of weird therapy in some ways. It's like, get this thing out, get this kind of concept down, which might just be something like inspired by a video game, like that forest, piece was like from 2014 I think like that was yeah. dark I, I think I was just playing the heck out of Dark Souls at the time and I was mm -hmm. like I want to paint just something like this but at that point I think I was still very much in my you know I was still trying to build my portfolio and trying to be better as a painter now I'm much lazier and I don't do nearly as much personal work unless I want to express that, something in a new way I guess <laughs> are you lazier or just more busy it's a great question both I think I'm actually less busy right now because I've actually dropped most of my clients recently I'm taking a little bit of time off work at the moment so technically I think right now definitely lazier but actually it, there's a weird thing that happens I mean I've always worked a lot and I've always worked on a lot of projects at once I mean I used to work when I was working uh, in-house at Axis Animation for example which is a big animation house we do all the stuff for Magic all the beautiful trailers you see for Magic the Gathering that they've been doing for the last few years they're all done by Axis really uh, in, in Glasgow yeah yeah we, we do all of those well, kudos, so I haven't actually worked on any personally but well but kudos to the the mm. the latest one is is nuts yeah the team is absolutely insane I mean we have amazing art directors like Bram Sells you know who also works on card art Mark, Mark Molnar like just amazing amazing art directors um I, alas, was always working on something else. I was working on like Destiny for a long time when we were doing those and uh, other other cinematics at the time. I was like, why why can't I do a magic one? Um, but like, no, I mean, they absolutely kill it. But, but when I was working at Axis, yeah, I would be working on, you know, a cinematic for Destiny or Guild Wars or whatever. And then at night coming home and working on magic. So it's like, I've always worked a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the actual, the, the main change that's happened with me over the last few years is, um, I, ha I, I burnt out pretty bad a couple of years or like about a year ago, like life was just crazy, of course, um, work was a bit too much. So I really burned out hard on art and I needed a break. And that's when I switched much more over to kind of development. So like I've been developing a game for the last kind of like three years, um, pen and paper role-playing game. Um, is, is that is and, it the Pale Tides one with that I was reading? Yeah, that, yeah that's Pale Tides, uh, which is, I'm not saying too much about yet, but it's basically a dark gothic horror um role-playing game all about witches um mm. and a very direct kind of uh interpretation of witchcraft in a way that generally doesn't get touched usually wizards are just like people who fire spells off like guns um which doesn't really align with how witchcraft traditionally is supposed to work so anyway uh so i've, I've turned my creative juice from doing art stuff into doing like world building for my own project which has been wonderful for my mental health honestly um because mm -hmm. i love writing and, and and creating um and for me like people sometimes find this surprising when they talk to an artist who's you know worked on a game like magic or something like that for a long time and you're like well you must love art so much it's like it's fine i like it but it's just a, it's just a tool for me like i i see art as just a kind of means of expression if that makes sense it sounds a bit wanky but like Art's just one of the ways I can communicate. And in a lot of ways, it's the most efficient way I can communicate because you can do a lot with an image and uh, you know, in, in a short space of time. But I love writing and making music and stuff like that as well. So it's been nice jumping ship a little bit more and, and focusing on that over the last few years, so. 
Yeah, you're a drummer, right? Hmm. Yes, drummer as well. Um, and what's the name of your band? I'm not in one right now, actually. Uh, one now? Okay. You're, 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 the last you're... band, uh, we split up like four years ago and I took a big old break. So I'm not in a band right now. I don't really have time, to be honest, at the moment because I'm focusing too much on my, my thing. But maybe, maybe again. I, I do miss it very much. I, I'm definitely... I have a lot of energy, a lot of creative energy in general. Um, so I kind of want to do everything. And I'm like, I could be in like five bands right now. That'd be sweet. But then I mean, get nothing done. <laughs> there's drum circles and witches. I mean, who knows? You know, once the game's getting going, you could just record some drum circles. Exactly. And, oh know. my God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we go do the soundtrack. <laughs> right? I mean, there's a lot of... Did you see... I, I'm sure you saw The, the Witch uh, that came out, that movie a few years ago that came out. It was so, so good. So good. It's incredible. That was that, hilarious you mentioned it because that was actually the original inspiration for the game. Uh, that's that's when I started working on the game. I saw that movie in the cinema, I think, and I was like, yep, that's what I'm making. <laughs> like when I saw The Witch, uh, I, I, it was just like like right in the chest. It's so mm. terrifying. And it is, it's great. And so, and, and I'm fascinated by the fact that you say that you are into horror. Um, I mm. saw that you did the artwork for um uh the poster for anna and the apocalypse which is really cool i mean yeah. uh, now how did you land that gig i i mean because it's a scottish film right yeah so it's a scottish film um i was working with the company who made it at the time so i was an in-house lead artist at blazing griffin which is the company that made that film um we we're like a game studio but also partnered at some point with a film studio and a post-processing house so it's like all three basically in glasgow so i just was basically their main artist in general so I did some concept for the film like right at the start of production um and then when it came time to do the poster I was like well, obviously I'm gonna do it um so and that was really fun because I'd never done a kind of grindhouse like I, like kind of like classic horror poster and it was really nice chance to riff I, I'm a big fan of um Ollie Moss's work so it was a little, little bit of a riff on, on Ollie's work um and yeah, that was that was super fun. And again, that, that's a good example, though. Like, I love doing stuff in different styles. Like, I don't. While a lot of my magic stuff maybe is the same kind of style, I guess. Like that that like fantastical style. Um, over the years, I've worked on like so many different kinds of projects, like photo real stuff and like super stylized stuff. Um, I love it. Well, <laughs> I, get I mean, bored otherwise. You you maybe the same style, but at the same time, like I mean, it's interesting, and I I find it kind of I mean I don't know if you knew the the, the power of the card before it came out, but force and negation when you <laughs> throw them in the middle of of all of your pieces, that one just explodes out. Did you have any idea that it was going to become the card that it was going to become? I yeah, I knew it was going to be big. Uh, so Cynthia Shepard was my art director for most of my um, magic cards because. I've been a huge fan of Cynthia for ages and, and I really loved working with her. Um, she gave me the brief for that card and was just like, just so you know, this is probably going to be a pretty big new counter spell. Uh, counter spell. So yeah, uh, have fun with this one. And I was like, this is going to be, I get the feeling this is going to be big, you know. Um, I didn't know how big, to be fair. I didn't know how, you know, you never really know. That's the weird thing about working on magic. You never really know. Um, you know, when I did Ristic Study, that that was like, a, okay, well, that's a that's a known thing, um, mm -hmm. you know. But like, Robber of the Rich is a good example. Like, Robber of the Rich was like a completely random legendary, right? It's legendary, right? Is it? uh, no, it's not it's legendary rare. because yeah. you can have two of them out on the field at once. Yeah. But, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but it's a bitch of a card. I mean, like that thing will take you out. Like, it's, yeah, I have so much Sorry. stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but that's the thing. Like, you have no idea for the most part, um, and that's. A weird and I think cool thing about magic actually, you know, when you get briefed, you you quite often have no idea whether yours is going to be meta, whether it's going to be just some garbage, uh, you know, which is hilarious when you spend, you know, like six we get like six weeks to work on a magic card. So mm -hmm. if you really go to town on something because you love the concept and it's like a total flop, it's just like, <laughs> but you know, it's still fun. I mean, it's it may be the cards a flop, but the, the the pieces of art are not because I've some. Mm. I mean, I was always when I started playing, I was one of those players that like I would put a card in my commander deck that I did not care that it was not going to win me a game. I just yeah. like the art. I'm one of those people that will build flavor decks because I just I just like it, and nobody can stop yeah. me. Um, yeah. What would you say? Uh, I mean, obviously we talked about those two, but um, uh, what are some of your personal like greatest hits that you consider your greatest hits of your magic career oh boy um 
So I painted like 50 cards now, I think. Um, so it, <clears throat> some of them have changed meaning somewhat because of world events. Like my, my relationship with my heuristic study changed a little bit. And that, like some, some of them, I, I, it, it's too much to go into, to be honest. Really? But like, I, I love, I think, I, I think that's still one of my favorite illustrations I've ever done. Um, so I'm, pr I'm very proud of that one. Um, Aurelia, I think, is one of my favorite illustrations. I think that's probably the best illustration I've ever done because it's like, I, I still look back on that and I'm like, that one's pretty good. Um, yes. The Royal Scions was huge because like, I got to do a planeswalker and I got to do two planeswalkers in one, which like, that was kind of crazy. That is crazy. Um, and uh, I guess the other one would be... Um, I can never remember the names of my cards because and okay, this is the, why we have this is why we have cutting. This is exactly why we cut because then let's just go to Scryfall for a second, here. and that's and no one will ever know. No one will know. Uh, I don't care. Anyone who's ever seen my stream knows that my brain basically doesn't work. Um, Chain to Memory is another absolute favorite of mine. That um, one is is yeah. great, and I did not realize that. And you, I read that that and duress are two. You said two um, attempts for you to convey what it is like to suffer from depression. Yes, yeah. Chain to Memory in particular uh, is, again, sounds very pretentious um, out of context, but like, the, I don't remember exactly what the brief said, but it was basically like talking about um, struggling with essentially anxiety and being chained to the past and memories and stuff like that. And I, I have anxiety disorder, but I also had, not to go down this road, but like I had a full on existential crisis when i was nine which has haunted my life ever since then what happened oh god um well i was on holiday with my, with my family and i remember lying in bed this is great content for a podcast lying in bed and um it was late at night and i <clears throat> i'm not sure why but i think at that moment i realized i was going to die and i had a full-on like descent and it felt like i was being pulled into myself oh. felt like i was being pulled underwater yeah um and it was this over i mean it was basically a panic attack you know i had mm -hmm. a, like existential crisis and a panic attack at once and it literally haunted me throughout my childhood i used to have nightmares about it and i could conjure up that feeling at will and it was horrible um and anyway as i grew older i didn't do that so much anymore but i've always had anxiety and um the feeling is really really similar it's like this kind of crushing uh, sense like you're at the bottom of the ocean and like you're you're trapped but you're also flailing around at the same time so anyway when the brief for chain to memory came up like Cynthia sent me this brief and I was like that sounds so much like you know that that experience of being like trapped and like haunted by everything in your past and unable to do anything and, and uh, just completely as soon as I read that I was like I mean, this is that. And I basically emailed her back and I was like, can I do this? Is it okay if I do like a really kind of personal piece? And she's like, yeah, of course. I mean, definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's surprisingly, yeah. Uh, it's very, very stark uh, when you compare it to a lot of the other, especially in, on Theros, it's, it's very grounded and very sad. It's just like, it doesn't necessarily have to be on Theros because the emotion conveys to whatever place you are at. Yeah, yeah. It was it was interesting. <laughs> I don't, I showed it to my therapist at one point. And she was like, "Yes, <laughs> that makes sense." Um, but it was a fascinating experience, and to to indulge in it just a little bit more, it was very interesting actually. Because when I painted it, uh, I did a tweet about this at the time. I tried the almost like method approach of like bringing myself back into that mental state, which was really interesting because I hadn't done that since I was a kid. So I basically just drank a bottle of whiskey and like tried to get you know right back into it and the funny thing about it is there's an interesting detail in that card which no one will ever notice or care about but it's it's per it's very personal to me it's why i mentioned it but like okay. there's a thing that's happening in that card where like sand is running through his hands and like blurring and like becoming part of the water or the sand and like, mm -hmm. the whole idea is like it could be underwater it could be in space like who who knows where this is it's in the yes. mind um, but looking at that gives me anxiety to this day. Like I, I, I love that card, but I find it hard to look at because it actually conjures up that image, which is really and, weird. And what I, what I got from it was that he's also, uh, th there's sand running through it, but it almost looks like as though his hand is disintegrating. Disintegrating. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely the idea. It was like the connection between him and the, where he is, cause he's in himself technically. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it was all interlinked. And you can also see like kind of ghosts of himself trying to sort of struggling. And then the actual character himself is unable to struggle. He's he's dejected, he's given up and he's 
giving up and going away. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> and then there's the, the 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 different motions in the background, and it looks like there's a. I mean, it appears to be a young woman's face in the mm. in, in the sky. That mm -hmm. I, I mean, and and yet you did. It was really cl clever the way you made the stars like work as as the the whites of the iris, that kind of stuff. It's it was mm -hmm. really good. Now. Hi, it's uh, Paul from the future here. Uh, I lost internet at this point of the interview. <laughs> and, um, yeah, when we reconnected, we started talking about the games industry a bit. So we're now transitioning very slickly to a conversation about uh, how I feel about the games industry. Enjoy! I, I, I've had a very conflicted relationship with the games industry in general, I will say. Um, when I was working in house as a concert artist um i struggle a lot with the game fan base because gamers are the worst i, I am a gamer mm -hmm. but like gamers that are horrible and releasing a game was honestly a nightmare for the entire team most of the time um you know every time we release a game you have to go through steam reviews from people who played the thing for like 10 minutes and are just like you know ranting and, and raving vitriolic and they're yeah, vitriolic, and obviously the, the Gamergate stuff happened you know, a few years ago, and that was like embroiled so many of my friends and, and you know f people I know from journalism and stuff like that. And it was just like I, I had I had a complicated relationship with the games industry, and over the last few years, one thing that's happened more and more um, is that I've ended up having a complicated relationship with people from you know from within as well, because like a lot of a lot of cis dudes mostly have have been outed as total sex pests at best um a lot of just like terrible horrible assholes honestly a lot of people who were my friends who have had to basically cut from my life and um you know we were talking before a little bit about like trying to be a voice <laughs> you know because like i've got a pretty big platform and like yeah. trying trying to do something at least because you know my belief very much is that it's on us it's always on me and cis dudes really honestly who make up such a large part of the the workforce in the industry which is you know a thing that we need to fix over time um it's on us to fix this stuff because it's it's cis dudes who are causing all the problems <laughs> for the most part in our industry so mm -hmm. yeah you know calling calling people out trying to get better at that because it I, it's something i feel passionately about because i hate the way that our industry can be um and and how uh you know for me as a kid growing up like games were a total respite i didn't know a lot of people who played video games um i was a very anxious nervous child and like playing magic and uh playing video games and stuff you know that was my safe space right you know playing your world of warcrafts playing diablo one and two back in the day like th they were the way i escaped from reality and felt kinship with people. And I hate the fact that, you know, the World of Warcraft I mentioned, obviously because of the Blizzard stuff recently, like I hate the impact that men in this industry have had on people who are trying to just have a normal ass interesting career. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, me trying to use my platform uh, to hopefully encourage other men to like, I don't know, be better, like learn, think about this stuff. Um, yeah, it's really important to me. Well, yeah, it's very tricky. It's, it's, I, I feel like I got a little bit of a early benefit from being Jewish and gay that, you know, I always, you know, that helped me uh, in, in my worldview. But there's certain things that you don't think about because you're, you're, as people were very myopic. Like the other day, I was sitting in bed and I looked at my screen poster and I thought, everybody is the exact shade of white like that's mm -hmm. just, and I, you know that kind of stuff does not happen that doesn't you don't think about that when you are not able to think about that because it's sort of just out of your wheelhouse we're limited as as humans and it's not our mm -hmm. fault that's just how we are and so it is it's important to to sort of push it into the conversation because yeah it may seem like something that is being sort of uh, agenda now, but the uh, goal, I think, is to eventually have it become so normal that it no longer is needed to be sort of exactly. pushed in everyone's face. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of gatekeeping in our industry and in games. I mean, in all media, you know, there's a lot of a lot of gatekeeping, and 
a lot of people pushing back on the idea and, and throwing around the word, you know, woke as, as a slur. And it's like, like you said, you know, this is a step we have to go through, really. You know, we're we're all learning and some people are doing a better job than others. But like, from my experience, at least in the industry, I've worked in any studio I've ever worked in that had a more balanced fucking like workforce, you know, people from different cultures, people from with different experiences, it always results in better content because yeah. you have more than just like 40 white guys who've all lived the same life, you know, like, yeah. what are we inspired by? We're inspired by Lord of the Rings and aliens. Like, yeah. cool, yeah. good job. Bud. Like, nice yeah. breasts. Exactly. We like the things we like, you know, it's like, it's so boring. And like the same people who are complaining about woke culture and complaining about, you know, uh, you know, Marvel putting out a film where like black people are making the film and they're just like, whoa, like are the same people who are complaining about everything being the same. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, it's yeah, it drives me wild. It absolutely I, drives me wild. I mean, I just, I guess, I don't know. I never had the sort of thinking. I just don't get I, <laughs> I, the problem with racism, and this is off topic, the problem with it is that it's just sort of what a stupid person uses when they don't have enough creativity to dislike somebody for a legit reason. Like, I am, I, if, if somebody's a, like an asshole to me, that's my reason. I don't need something as base and as just like troglodytish as like, oh, you look different. Yeah. So that, yeah. therefore, I don't like you. I'd be like, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm a little bit evolved. I need, you know, an actual <laughs> reason to yeah. to dislike somebody not that i you know i don't dislike a lot of people i mean okay i dislike a lot of people but i love a lot of people you know <laughs> yeah and that's fine you know that's but it that's has life. nothing to do with the 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 skin color um it has everything to do with whether or not they're good looking i'm just kidding <laughs> um, yeah yeah that's really important you know <laughs> yeah. it, it, i only yes. talk to beautiful people <laughs> only beautiful people ever yeah. um yeah, yeah. so yeah the, well that's it's that's nice it's it's admirable and i don't think that it is you know something that i mean i've always this is actually one of the first conversations that i've had where we've even able to be to delve into it because it's a it's a subject that i don't necessarily push because i don't want anybody mm. to be uncomfortable and i never yeah. want to i don't like to make an interview where it's putting anyone on the spot i i'm not yeah. howard stern uh i love howard stern i'm bet i'm not howard stern and i don't want to piss anybody off because you guys you artists specifically are such a close-knit group of people and which is wonderful um, the way you support each other and the way that you look mm. out for each other that I do know that if I, you know, if I'm making an enemy out of one, I'm making an enemy out of everyone. Yeah, I guess, but that, that, that's fucked. <laughs> you know, you should, you're, in, you should be entitled to your opinion. And, well, I mean, and, I have my you know, opinions. It's just, yeah. sometimes I don't know if my opinions are necessarily worth, I don't know, bringing to the conversation, especially in an interview. So, so you know, sure setting where this well, is my I'm an open book like th this is the thing you know we talked about it before like my whole brand and I have to use it in that because I hate the idea of like being a brand but like at a certain point you are I guess like my whole brand and the stuff I try and do through um my Twitter account but also through my Twitch streams for example and like the art community that I've been building mm -hmm. so I have an art community called the nice friend club which is literally like the most supportive wonderfully diverse group of artists from all parts of the industry and it's like just the best i don't know i've lucked out so much um the whole the whole part the whole thing with that is like just trying to be open and honest talking about stuff that is hard confronting people when they're being shitty <laughs> confronting myself when i'm being shitty and talking about things i've done wrong in the past like just trying to be um honest about that stuff and trying to encourage people it's like trying to encourage people to get into the industry and also trying to at the same time encourage people to fix the goddamn industry because <laughs> like you know we have to do it you know like uh it's, it's a complicated thing so I, I try and be as honest and open about anything really because you know i'm i'm still learning as well that's the thing i always say whether it's art or trying to be a good feminist or just trying to be a good god damn human being like i'm still learning you know i'm still a shitty 35 year old white guy who's that's trying a little to learn. harsh that's a little <laughs> well, harsh no I, I, I don't know if you know. i would call you a shitty 35 year old white guy <laughs> in like your autobiography like <laughs> no that's the first line right I, uh, artist no. shitty 35 year old <laughs> i don't know i try to be critical of myself because i think it's important and uh anytime i talk about like accolades or things i'm trying to do i think it's 
really important to me that it doesn't come across as some sort of weird like hero complex or something like that it's like I genuinely want to be better <laughs> and I genuinely want my my industry of artists I guess you could call it I want it to be healthier I want the games industry to be more welcoming so that everyone can have a nice time there not just like some guys who are going to make it to the top and you know shit all over everyone else so yeah well, you know, and now is the perfect time to talk about you being featured in Spectrum because since you oh. <laughs> since you don't want to talk too much about yourself, no, but I, I'm teasing, but, but you were in Spectrum and that's fantastic. Uh, yes. Now, what was the reason? I, what was the uh, the reason for the, submitting that piece? Because I'd imagine it's tricky because you have so many choices at that time. How do you pick which one you intend to submit, and what was I don't even got that word that they said that you were. I don't even remember what I've had. I've had, I've been in Spectrum twice, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, some of us just enter it honestly, just for funsies, really. Uh, you know, it's nice to get featured in a thing. I think the first time I got spe featured in Spectrum, uh, you know, I was, was a lot longer ago, I guess, in my career. And it was definitely a big thing. It was like, oh, you know, <laughs> published. That's so cool. Like, you know, the same time as like getting into like Imagine Effects would be, you know, really inspiring as well, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas like I would go on to write for Imagine Effects, like I've written loads of articles for them. It's it's the classic thing with art, like it's it, it starts off as like a wow, and then you do it, and then you're like, ah, you know, it's cool. Uh, so it, it's really nice. I, I it, it's nice having your work in print. I will say, like it, it's always nice, and I never take it for granted. Really, it's I don't remember what piece pieces I've had in though. Um, I, 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 I'm trying, I had it pulled up, but it's, there's a, it's, it looks almost like a Cthulhu style monster mm. in a waterfall. Um, yes. The one that I was thinking of in Spectrum 22. Um, yes. I'm just, I, I like the fact that, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if that was connected to anything that you were doing as far as, um, if it was connected to an IP or not. No, that was personal work. Um, yes, I think that was yes. like 2014 or something, or 2015, maybe later. I actually don't remember. And that's also fascinating to me when you submit a personal piece and you mm -hmm. you you get in because that same thing had happened with. Um, I just interviewed Fesbra yesterday, and he he mm -hmm. he also submitted a personal piece that got into Spectrum, and I'm always blown out by that because it's almost like that seems like it would almost be tougher to do, not because of um you know like because oh well magic will get you in because it's magic but but mm. just because you're you're almost bearing yourself even more so with your vulnerability because it is a personal piece yeah i yeah i think you're right um f from my perspective and i think for certainly other artists it's mostly just about validation honestly you know everything can be broken down into validation really like as artists, we are in a perpetual state of uncertainty and discomfort around our own work. Um, and it's very validating to have, you know, a team of great artists judge you and, you know, consider you worthy of those hallowed pages. <laughs> so like, for me, I think it was very much like that. It was like, this is the best painting I've done. Let's send it in. And then when they picked it, I guess it's like, that's really cool. That's really exciting and validating. Um, it's the thing it's the kind of thing that happens now i think more from you know discord groups where you've got like a bunch of artists in a discord group like supporting each other and celebrating each other it that achieves a very similar goal and like i haven't applied for spectrum in ages uh leisha and i used to do it sometimes just for funsies because well, uh we battle you, over it you should though i mean you've you i mean but why not i mean your your stuff is still spectrum -y. yeah i guess it it doesn't mean as much now though i think like it's oh. the classic it's the, it's the classic thing with any with any you've you know, gotten too big for spectrum I'm just too you. cool for spectrum now you know like i need the next thing all right i need the next big thing yes um i've done that and also i'm too lazy okay. yeah, we're, we're over a spectrum we're on to i don't know I'm, what else is better. i won't be doing anything unless it's the cover darling anything <laughs> exactly yeah that that's my next step with magic is like i'm done with cards i only want to do <laughs> covers now right um, i'm i'm only doing promo material thank you i would but, love to do promo i'm not good enough <laughs> well you know um I, but you know the, the the planeswalker thing is a pretty big deal i mean like the, mm. was the first double planeswalker like uh two of them right together right. was that yeah. how stressful was that project oh my God. that was the hard yeah that was the hardest illustration i ever did um for sure because 
so usually uh, so we get six weeks to do a magic card generally that's like the usual turnaround um mm -hmm. usually a magic card takes me anything between four days and like three weeks like on average it, most of my cards take about a week generally uh some of them have been much faster uh sir alice sir alan sir alan can mm -hmm. remember the name sir alan took literally like two days that was like an absolute like i had to get this thing done i classic adhd left it right till the very end and then i absolutely nuked through that thing but um yes the royal scions took the entire time plus i was late i redid that piece so many times uh because i was so scared like doing a planeswalker is a huge deal it's um very high bar i think to to meet personally i, I certainly felt that way um well yeah the, the process was wild <laughs> yeah yeah planeswalkers yeah. are definitely the um like they're the the they're aspirational for, for sure mm. yeah yeah, definitely. So like that, that was a wild process. Like I did a lot, I, I did quite a few sketches, which I don't normally do. I'm usually like a one sketch person. I know what, I know what I want when I start the piece usually. Um, but I ended up doing maybe five sketches for that one, doing color roughs for them. Uh, then like, I could not make up my mind about the, the, the background. Um, one fun, I don't know if it's an Easter egg. There's a few, there's a few Easter eggs in some of my magic cards. Um, but, uh, a friend of mine on the writing team had, knew that I was working on that card um, and reached out to ask if I would like it for them to be Scottish because obviously I was in the card oh. and um, she reached out and was just like would you like if you were casting for this right now and I was thinking it might be fun to do them as Scottish characters as a little kind of insider kind of tribute thing yeah. I was like that's so sweet so I tried to make the background you know very Scottish I mean it's obviously fantasy as heck but yeah a little fun little fact because I ultimately they ended up casting um uh-huh thingy Billy Billy uh, is it Billy name. Boyd yeah 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 Billy Boyd from, from Lord uh, of the Rings uh yeah so Billy Boyd and Anna Graves to do the yes. voices for them and they did Scottish accents and it was just like a really sweet thing to have you know the twins be these sort of Scottish characters uh and it meant a lot to me so that's it's, a, really it's cool. another personal card that's yeah. really cool um are there any other sort of like sort of behind the scenes things with your cards that that are akin to that i love i love those like little easter eggy moments um a few royal si um rustic study sorry has a few because uh i had to paint maps there's a lot of map i think there's 30 maps in that card oh my lord um and a lot of them are obviously obscured and they're just little bits um actually a funny story about this before i even get to this is that originally i was being clever and i painted the maps each of the maps in that painting to be a map from another magic card so like to have this kind of fun thing that like you know this this um wow. mage was collecting you know these maps from all the history of magic and i like faithfully recreated every single one of them and sent it in and cynthia was like yeah you can't you can't really do that because it's gonna like potentially raise all kinds of expectations about future sets and stuff like that and people will look for spoilers oh. they'll look for all this they'll be like oh wow like dominaria like whoa this you know like so maybe they'll see Com i mean she's right community that's, that's, that makes magic sense. Anything, they'll totally data mine you know any any piece of artwork so i ended up making they're all custom now uh, i'm not going to say what their easter eggs are but there are definitely a two or three of those maps that are very scottish uh and have like things from my kind of homeland uh so there's definitely some easter eggs in that one um i can't think about any others but yeah um it's fun to try and slide in the odd little kind of cheeky thing into a into a card um, that, that makes a lot of sense though i never was able to understand why there was there seemed to be sort of a, a, a difficulty with easter eggs but you know mm. now that you mentioned the way she the way cynthia put it that makes sense because if you make it something that is done once then it is too going to be expected and people will bitch and moan if it's not there yeah exactly um so you, you don't want to create unreasonable expectations or just unfair expectations honestly it doesn't make any sense uh, so like none of the maps mean anything for from from this for magic's lore really um but some of them mean stuff to me which is cute now how do you manage to be colorblind and do <laughs> what you do uh which is okay so like for instance like well force negation or zalfarin decoy decoy uh, yes um that seems like that would just be very 
I mean, difficult. What? Okay, so what do you see? Have you? Have you? What is your your t- your type of of colorblindness? What is the 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 uh, the the ranking? I guess they have for it. So the annoying thing about this is I don't hundred percent align with any of them, which is really annoying. Basically, I can't see green at all. Like I, I can see it, but green and yellow completely merge for me really um so i'm kind of more pro tan side but like i have some do tan do tan i don't know how to say it um aspects as well um yeah green and yellow are completely indistinguishable to me so, um yeah. like when you're at a traffic light or i guess an american traffic light I, but so you can't tell the difference between the yield and the the go I would see them as different values, um, but in in that case, that's where like common sense comes in. Which yes, is, yeah. Which, by the way, that that sounds like a that wasn't meant to be a diss. By the way, that's that's a really really common thing. People when, when people are kind of interested in color blindness, they'll always be like, well, you know, what color is the grass? And it's like, well, <laughs> your brain obviously like comes in with like grass is green, like. But yeah, definitely. If if those two colors, rather than being aligned on the traffic light, were put side by side or something like that, yeah. then yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you which one was green. Um, and that's why, so I, I do use a lot of color in my work and, and I, you know, I've always gravitated towards quite colorful stuff. Um, it's either, it's either basically black and white or like insanely colorful. These are like my, the two sides of my personality. Apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, you'll notice, you'll definitely notice I veer towards certain palettes more. Um, so for example, you know, force of negation, reds and blues are very comfortable for me. So a lot of my palettes veer into sort of cool, or, or sort of intense reds and blues, like Aurelia, all yellow, all gold, you know. Um, Rhystic is mostly blue. Um, I will bring in greens and stuff where I, you know, where it's appropriate. I actually haven't really done that many green cards though. Like I think the spooky creature from uh god the spooky horned skull face creature is like one of the only green cards i think i've done i can't spooky hor- horn skull face <laughs> you know spooky horn skull face the classic oh, yeah. theros card uh <laughs> i should say so um, like, the, this is, yeah the this is... <laughs> the bony the bony mule no like the bony moose guy i forgot yeah i know bony you're... moose guy that he, he's, he's got he, he... <laughs> we both fail as magic what? So the, the fun thing about magic is that we, when we are working on the cards, they don't have their official names usually. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. every time I have a conversation with anyone about magic, they're like, oh, you did this card. I'm like, maybe. Yes, <laughs> sure. That sounds like a thing I might've done. Uh, but yeah, like I've done very, I mean, I'm looking at my square fall right now. Just out of interest. Like I have done so few green cards, which is great. Cause I basically can't see green. That's, um, yeah. You know, now that you mention it, but at the same time, like, the background for the the, the science uh, that would mm. there's a lot of green in that though you know i mean yeah definitely i mean uh, it's using reference basically to, to answer your first question is like how do you navigate being an artist with color blindness um <clears throat> it's, it's a combination of getting pretty good at color theory and understanding how colors work um Working digitally is very helpful because I know what the colors are and I can check them. It's much, much harder to do it traditionally. Right. Um, I do miniature painting I'm back there. I've got like a model I'm working on right now. Much harder because I can't color pick. So if I mix up a kind of greenish hue, I don't know what color that is. Like it could be green, it could be brown. I just have to kind of go with it. Um, but digital painting, you know, helps a lot with that. Yeah. And then I then just using reference as well. So like, you know, I use a lot of photo reference in my work as every artist does. Um, and that means I can pick colors from real life and, and use them, you know, there. Um, I've done articles, I've written articles about colorblindness. Um, yeah, for Muddy Waters, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, one for Muddy, Muddy, Muddy Colors and one for, for Muddy, sorry. Kotaku as well. I did one with um, Luke for Kotaku. Um, just because it's, I guess it's just a weird thing. It's also like one of those things, like, it was a nightmare for me when I was a kid. And then I forget about it a lot of the time because I've just developed, you know, ways to work around it. Uh, but it was very funny the last few years, people, I remember I, I, I finally felt confident enough to speak about it because like for a long time, I really wasn't. I was really nervous that um, throughout most of my career that I wouldn't get hired if people yeah. knew I was colorblind. Well, I, yeah, I mean, in some ways, like fair enough because like when I was working as an art director in cinematics, for example, a lot of my job would be doing color scripts and analyzing you know the animations we were working on we were working i remember working on like a destiny cinematic um 
sitting in a room with you know with our director and like a bunch of people from the company with like a big uh you know some stills from the cinematic we're working on at this time and being like you know why did you guys pick these colors and like that was like literally my worst nightmare where i'm having to be like i can't i don't know like i would just have to kind of bullshit my way around it because like without being able to sit down and open it up in photoshop and check the colors i wouldn't actually be able to confirm why we made those choices if that makes sense so it, it was it was bizarrely hard it was i did a post about it on twitter i remember um where i just said like you know i finally feel confident enough to talk about it that wasn't true at all i was absolutely not confident enough to talk about it i just thought it would be useful uh for kids or artists gr growing up you know um because for a long time i felt like i wouldn't be able to do it right um yeah it's it's definitely it's not uncommon but i think the main you know, much like our conversation before about like just putting information out into the world or like you know i i struggle with it a lot as a kid uh, as you know knowing whether i should be an artist or whether i should just be a musician which is my other kind of you know road and you know i always veer on the path of just share stuff from your life so that you know people can know that they can make it <laughs> well yeah you know oh no i don't think you i mean you've made you it's not make it you've made it uh, I think that, you know, you are doing a service because up until that point, if nobody had spoken about it, if nobody speaks about it, then maybe some gatekeeper is going to be the person who says, well, if you're colorblind, you can't be an artist. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's, that's just not true because there you go, you know, like, you are an yeah, artist. apparently you can just muddle your way through it <laughs> well you know i mean it's you make it but you again you downplay you you took the time to to do it and you use the resources that you could and you were able to tackle it i mean it's it's you know it is a sort of you know it's that's not something that you want to have happen to you in a you know being an artist but it's not something that can stop you dead in your tracks it's not like oh I can't, you know, like, well, I don't know what an example would be, but like, I don't know if like you were beheaded, then you probably can't be a pilot anymore. But did you also wouldn't be able to do a lot of stuff if you were beheaded? No, no, that, that definitely would mess up your art career for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, being headless, it's, it's hard to live being headless. Let's it does sound good sometimes, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> well, trust me, I'm headless most of the time. It's, it works. I'm sorry, it's brainless. Okay. So um, before I let you go, I want to ask, is there anything that you are working on now that you are allowed to discuss? Um, uh, anything that you would like to promote that is on the um, upcoming schedule? So um, I don't have anything to promote work-wise, really. Um, the only thing I would say is if you are an artist or you're wanting to become an artist, I definitely recommend you check out my Twitch stream. Um, I run a bi-weekly study stream where I basically just trying to encourage people to come along and learn with me and we we're doing studies of different films and master paintings and all sorts of stuff um so if if people want to learn that kind of stuff you should definitely follow me on twitter at the big bat and on twitch at twitch.tv slash paul scott canavan I wish my name was shorter but here we are um and yeah you know come along for that because it's like i'm trying to really build a really encouraging lovely community of artists and anyone who wants to get into art you know and, and try and be supportive so definitely come and do that um and i i talk about all my projects on twitter anyway or on twitter anyway so yeah well nothing nothing wrong with a little self-promotion and before the final question would be <laughs> what is the last horror movie that you saw that was just brilliant oh well, not a horror movie, but I just finished Midnight Mass a couple of weeks ago with my friend, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's on Netflix. Have you seen it? I've not seen it yet, but I will put it on my to-do list. You will love it. Oh my, you will love it. Trust That's, me. I saw uh, ads for it. It looks good. I mean. It's another Mike Flanagan piece. I loved Haunting of Hill House very mm -hmm. much. Uh, I thought Bly Manor was pretty good. I enjoyed that too. This is my favorite of his company's projects uh, it's definitely one not to spoil don't read about it just watch that you will oh. you i know you will absolutely I, that's it, exactly so. why i avoided it. i didn't read any articles about it because i'm like this i can't tell what it's about i don't want to know what it's about i'm just going to watch it when i yeah. when i say so it's so good <laughs> exciting exciting yeah. Well, cool. Thank you so much again. This has been a great uh great conversation and i appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really, really nice. Uh, let's do it again sometime. I'm always down to talk forever about myself. You know, I love that. <laughs> I love talking about myself too. 
That's crazy. <laughs> I, I actually don't, I hate talking about myself. I'm just like the whole time. I'm just like, oh my really? God. Oh gosh. Uh, Goodness uh, gracious, man. You got, you give yourself a little bit too much of a hard time. I, you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta be like, you know, be nice, be nice. Yeah. Be nice to myself. Mm -hmm. I've done some okay paintings. No, you've I, done some great well, painting. I'm pretty nice to people. <laughs> like you're, you're like, you're not adequate. <laughs> you're like you don't like i'm not adequate i know thank oh, you geez. thank you for reminding oh me oh my Jesus god Christ. oh my god god oh <laughs> but no it was so fun i really enjoyed okay it. <laughs> well you be nice to yourself and your great paintings and 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 keep fighting the good fight and uh have a good rest of your evening thank you so much i really appreciate it great scott isn't paul a great scott I think so, and I will have to have him back since we lost that bit of the interview due to the act of Wi-Fi betrayal. Meanwhile, I have a giveaway for you. If you subscribe to the channel, or already are subscribed, and like and comment on any five videos posted, you will be entered to win a free copy of Farce of Negation. Now, if that's not a farce to get you moving, then you've negated yourself out of a great opportunity. <sighs> that reminds me. I need to call the exterminator. Exterminator, we have crickets. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.